Okay, now that we've talked about some of the general events which occurred during T cell activation, here we're going to get down to a little bit more of the nitty gritty. There's a lot of material here, but again, if you want to nail those extra few points on the boards, these are probably things that you should commit to memory. Okay, so what we're going to do here is talk about the molecules that are involved in the activation of CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and B cells. Now, fortunately, immunologists have devised a pretty good working theory of what signals are needed to activate adaptive cells of the immune system. And traditionally, they're known as signal 1, signal 2, and signal 3. Signal 1 is provided by the MHC antigen complex. Now, this is important. Be aware that it's not just antigen floating around, but it has to be antigen presented or antigen bound to MHC class 1 or class 2 molecules. Signal 2 comes from co-stimulatory molecules. The most important co-stimulatory molecules are the B7 molecules. They include B71, which is also known as CD80, and B72, which is also known as CD86. The reason that co-stimulatory molecules are important and needed will be explained in a moment. Finally, immunologists define signal 3 as the cytokines that are needed to produce an optimal immune response. In other words, whereas signal 1 and signal 2 are required to generally activate adaptive cells, signal 3 in the form of various cytokines is needed to produce the correct subtypes of T and B cells. This is something that we already discussed, so let me just go back a few slides and point this out. So here they are. Here are the cytokines. These unique combinations of cytokines, in this case, produced unique kinds of T cells. And of course, each of these T cells is specialized to respond to the pathogens that stimulated the production of the cytokines you see here. The most important cytokines to know for the boards are these. Know that interferon alpha and interferon beta drive the production of cytotoxic lymphocytes. Know that interferon gamma and TNF alpha drive the production of CD4 Th1 cells. Interleukin 4 and interleukin 5 drive the production of CD4 Th2 cells and the combination of IL-6 and IL-7 drive the production of CD4 Th17 cells. Okay, let's go back to our slide. Now remember the general infection model that we came up with earlier. Remember that we had APCs that were located in the periphery and that served as the first responders to pathogens. I mentioned that these were typically macrophages and dendritic cells. B cells are also antigen-presenting cells, but they're typically not as good as macrophage and dendritic cells. And actually, the dendritic cell is the most important antigen-presenting cell. Remember, that's not only because it migrates to the lymph node to activate T and B cells, but also because it's the cell which best presents antigens via MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules. No cell has as many MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules as dendritic cells. That's the other special thing about dendritic cells. Notice that I said they have both MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules, which means that they can present viral peptides and intracellular bacteria, as well as they can present antigens from extracellular bacteria and fungus. So even though we talk about antigen-presenting cells, just remember that the most important one is the dendritic cell. Okay, very quickly, let's just flip back to our general infection model. And now we're just going to concern ourselves with the top half of this slide. Don't worry about all the cytokines and T-cell subsets that we talked about in the bottom. But remember, here we have our pathogens, and they've established an infection in the body by breaking the epithelial barrier. And that gives them a nice place to grow and extract the nutrients that they need to survive in a host. But now the attack is on. As soon as they get in, they're going to be recognized by dendritic cells. And these dendritic cells are going to become activated 
and of course migrate to the lymph node where they're going to meet up with circulating T and B cells. So it's the interaction between these two cells that we're going to talk about now in detail. So once the pathogen is taken up by the dendritic cell, it's going to be killed and digested by microbiocidal enzymes that the dendritic cell produces. The small peptides and other fragments from the pathogen are then going to be loaded onto MHC molecules. And here we have it drawn as MHC class 2 molecules. So here we have signal 1. Here's antigen being presented by an MHC class 2 molecule. Now which kind of T cell recognizes MHC class 2 molecules? Again, remember our mnemonic, CD4 times MHC class 2 equals 8. And CD8 times MHC class 1 equals the magic number 8. And as we'd expect, here we have the CD4 molecule. And this entire complex, that is the T cell receptor recognizing the antigen as it's being presented by MHC class 2 molecules, in the presence of CD4, that sends signal 1. But remember, for proper activation, we also need signal 2. And that, too, is provided by antigen-presenting cells. But again, most efficiently by dendritic cells. Here we have signal 2. Here is the B7 molecule. And we've actually not specified whether it's B71 or B72. That's OK. And it's being recognized by a receptor on the T cell that's known as CD28. That's less important. But this combination sends signal 2 into the T cell. This combination activates the T cell. And what I mean by that is that it stimulates the transcription and production of several pro-inflammatory molecules in the T cell itself. And these molecules cause the T cell to proliferate. And that's what we want, right? Because the dendritic cell has come into contact with a T cell which specifically recognizes the pathogen that's causing the infection. So we want to make many, many copies of this T cell so that they can attack the growing infection. Now you may be wondering why two signals are required to activate a T cell. Well, the explanation that immunologists have come up with goes like this. If only one signal were required to activate a T cell, so that only antigen bound to MHC molecules were required, we'd have a system that looks like this. So I can just sort of scratch this out. Now the problem with this is that for as good as negative selection is at eliminating autoreactive T cells, that is T cells which have the potential to recognize self-peptides, it is not perfect. In fact, if you look in the peripheral blood, scientists can actually find T cells which recognize self-peptides. But interestingly, these T cells have undergone a process which is known as energy. And this is a state in the T cell which is characterized by permanent inactivation. That is, these cells do not mount an immune response even when they recognize the antigen to which they're specific. And this is actually thought to be a mechanism by which autoimmunity is prevented. If an autoreactive T cell recognizes a self-antigen, or self-peptide, it becomes inactivated, or energized. And this happens because it's not receiving signal 2. If you were paying attention in immunology class, you might remember that co-stimulatory molecules are only produced on antigen-presenting cells when the antigen-presenting cell has recognized a pathogen that's causing infection. Thus, in the absence of an infection, there are no co-stimulatory molecules. And that's the way it should be, because there's no need to mount an immune response. Thus, even if autoreactive T cells are floating around in the blood and they recognize self-peptides, they will not be activated and autoimmunity will not occur. If you're really thinking ahead, you might realize that this might explain why some autoimmune diseases tend to present themselves following an infection. Because during an infection, of course, dendritic cells and other antigen-presenting cells have been activated and will begin producing co-stimulatory molecules. In that situation, an autoreactive T cell, which has not yet been energized 
might recognize a self-peptide and at the same time receive the co-stimulation that's needed for its activation. This is not totally set in stone, but it is a good working theory for why autoimmunity might more commonly result after an infection. Getting back to our typical immune response, once a CD4 T cell has been activated, it can typically do one of three things, as mentioned before. It can become a Th17 cell. It can become a Th2 cell, which we'll go over in a moment, or it can become a Th1 cell. And of course, as mentioned before, the subtype that it becomes is determined by the cytokines being produced by the antigen-presenting cell. I won't go over these here again. You can go back to the previous slides and, and fill them in if you want. But the important thing to realize is that Th17 cells recruit neutrophils to the site of infection, and this is particularly good when the pathogen is an extracellular bacteria or fungus. In that case, you want neutrophils infiltrating the infected tissue to phagocytose and destroy the extracellular pathogen. Remember that the Th2 response is well adapted to respond to extracellular parasites like helminthic worms, which are too large to be digested. In this case, you actually want to activate the B cell response and start producing antibodies, which can be secreted and directed at the parasite. Remember in this case, the most important cytokines are interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. Now in the previous slide I had said that interleukin-4 and interleukin-5 could be produced by dendritic cells. And that's true, but they can also be produced by Th2 cells. You can think of this as the body having a cell, in addition to dendritic cells, which is capable of producing interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. And that way you can really promote B cell activation and antibody production. In B cells, the co-stimulatory molecule is provided by a molecule known as CD40 ligand. And of course, if it's called CD40 ligand, then its receptor is called CD40, which is found on the surface of B cells. In this way, you can activate B cells and encourage their proliferation. This also instructs the B cell to isotype switch. Basically, that's just a change in the B cell where the antibody goes from being found only on the surface of the B cell to actually being secreted into the blood as soluble antibody. And we'll talk more about that later. And of course, the last important subtype of CD4 cells is known as the Th1 cell. Remember that these cells superactivate macrophages to become efficient killers, but they also activate CD8 T cells, or cytotoxic lymphocytes. And they do this by providing interleukin-2 to the CD8 T cell. Interleukin-2 actually promotes the proliferation of the CD8 T cell and allows it to make multiple copies of itself. It's not drawn here, but you should also be aware that CD8 T cells, like other T cells, require signal 2 from the co-stimulatory molecules. So I'm just going to draw that in here. And this is typically provided by dendritic cells again through the B7 molecules. And CD8 T cells, like their CD4 cousins, also have the receptor for B7, which again is called CD28. So here, of course, we have signal 2, and here we see that signal 1 is being provided by a virus-infected cell. Here's antigen, and of course it's being presented by class 1 molecules, and that's being recognized by the T cell receptor here which along with CD8 is providing signal 1. That was a lot, I know, but in summary, this can be broken down into just a couple conceptual steps. First, we have our pathogen, which is being recognized by our antigen-presenting cell, typically a DC, and this activation of the dendritic cell results in the production of MHC molecules, which are carrying the antigen, and co-stimulatory molecules, which are providing the crucial second signal. This in turn is being recognized by a T cell via its T cell receptor, and of course this in the presence of other cytokines, which are known as signal 3, help to determine the type of T cell subset 
that will form. And again, that can be the CD8 cytotoxic lymphocyte, the CD4 Th1 cell, the CD4 Th2 cell, or the CD4 Th17 cell.